In the previous video, I narrated the evolutionary story of vertebrates transitioning to land. However, this story is far from complete. The question remains, did the success of these vertebrates in colonizing land truly occur? You might think, of course they succeeded, as the existence of terrestrial vertebrates today is evidence. But, if I were to ask further, are the creatures mentioned last time, Tictilic and Ixiostiga, our ancestors? This question is incredibly complex and deserves a separate video for exploration. So, let's begin. While the fossil record may suggest a clear evolutionary pathway from Yosthenopteron to Pandorichthys Tictilic and then Ixiostiga, there is actually a significant bug in this narrative. Yosthenopteron fossils have been found in eastern Canada, Tictilic is distributed in northern Canada, and Ixiostiga was discovered on Greenland. Furthermore, similar fossils have been unearthed in various places around the world, such as Ventastega curonic from Latvia and Sinistega pani from China. The story seems to go like this. Around 381 million years ago, there was a group of tetrapod-like fish that traveled the world along a grand journey of evolution, evolving as they journeyed and finally making landfall in the new world. Doesn't that sound absurd? Thus, the true story of evolution should be even more grand. What these globally distributed fossils reveal should be a worldwide competition for landing. At that point in history, in every continent and every river around the world, countless tetrapod-like fish raced towards that great landmass. This isn't hard to comprehend. During the late Devonian period, both freshwater oxygen deficiency and thriving terrestrial ecosystems were likely common conditions. Environmental pressures and the lure of new ecological niches would have been similar. So, the Yosthenopteron, Tictilic, Ixiostiga, and others we mentioned earlier were just contestants in this epic race. They do not represent specific forms in our ancestral evolutionary line, but rather opponents competing on the global stage in the same race as our ancestors. Indeed, this is what real evolution looks like, though we tend to imagine it differently. These creatures probably weren't part of our evolutionary lineage from the start. It's just that fossils are incredibly rare resources, and the true forms of our ancestors' evolution have long been lost to history. However, the fossils of these competitors help us understand the evolutionary paths our ancestors took. For paleontologists, they were all moving towards the same goal, or one might say, pushed by fate in the same direction, much like mirrored reflections in different parallel universes. Having this information is sufficient, Yet while they share similar evolutionary trends, differences in details persist, and these differences indicate that they aren't our direct ancestors. For instance, consider the number of digits on their limbs. Ixiostiga has six digits. Echinotriton has eight digits per limb. If the descendants of Echinotriton developed a civilization, their mathematics might be hexadecimal, while we, as is well known, have five digits. Features like digit count aren't significant for early tetrapods' functionality, so independently evolving forms could differ. However, once established in development due to nerves, bones, and muscles, digit count becomes difficult to change easily, showcasing parallel evolution. Another intriguing difference is in breathing. Most of the tetrapod-like fish and early tetrapoda we mentioned before didn't breathe through nostrils like us, in a sense, they breathed through their ears. They had openings on the sides of their heads to take in air, which in us have evolved into the middle ear, no longer directly connected to the outside air. These differences not only reveal various possibilities in species evolution, but also hint at a harsh truth. Present-day terrestrial vertebrates all have five digits and breathe through nostrils, and they share certain skeletal characteristics that Ixiostiga, Echinotriton, and others lack. These signs suggest that while our ancestors weren't the sole participants in this competition, they were likely the victors. So, how did our ancestors win this race? Perhaps our ancestors were perhaps favored by the hand of fate. As mentioned earlier, the transition of tetrapod-like fish to land 
was largely due to freshwater oxygen depletion caused by plants. Around 382 million years ago, in the late Frasnian of the Devonian period, the accumulated stress on Earth's environment from plants finally erupted due to a set of coincidences. The atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration dropped below a critical point, resulting in a rapid decline in global temperatures and sea levels. Forests rapidly collapsed, and this ice age persisted for about 10 million years. Earth only returned to warmth after this period, but it brought forth catastrophic judgment day for aquatic animals across the globe. Massive rains washed over the fragmented and plant-ravaged land surface, flooding rivers, lakes, and oceans with massive nutrients, leading to the most ferocious algal bloom since the emergence of life. This ultimately wiped out 97% of vertebrate species, a series of calamities known as the late Devonian extinction. And those early terrestrial tetrapoda, whose eggs and young required aquatic development, and adults had to reside in damp rainforests, became one of the most severely affected groups in this extinction event. For the next 15 million years after the late Devonian extinction, tetrapod vertebrates virtually vanished from the fossil record, and this fossil record gap is known as Romer's Gap. During this period, how did our established ancestors, who had just landed, manage to survive? Unfortunately, due to the lack of fossils, the academic world remains ignorant. The only thing we know is that after this mass extinction, the only ones reappearing in the fossil record were those with five digits, breathing through nostrils, belonging to our evolutionary branch of terrestrial tetrapoda. It feels as if the hand of fate eliminated all our competitors, allowing our ancestors to directly win this race. Of course, this is just a feeling. The actual truth remains conjecture. Perhaps amidst this global cataclysm, there truly was a haven somewhere, where the waters remained oxygenated, the forests endured the ice age for millions of years, and the ecosystem remained intact. Either way, our ancestral evolutionary branch survived, ultimately enabling us to tell this ancient evolutionary story today. This is perhaps the so-called fate in the history of animal evolution. The story reaches this point, and surely there are friends already questioning the issue of terrestrial vertebrates having five digits, such as the wings and claws of birds, and the hooves of pigs and horses. Allow me to address this. In the process of biological evolution, there's a concept called specialization. The wings of birds are essentially a specialization of the ulna, where the other four digits have regressed. More precisely, the genes responsible for the other four digits were eliminated through competition in adapting to the flying environment. Similarly, the claws of birds have also specialized preserving the first four digits while the fifth digits regressed. However, remnants of the fifth digits still exist. Those who have eaten chicken feet might have noticed a small bump behind the chicken foot, which is the remains of the regressed fifth digits. The hooves of horses are specialized from the middle toe, while pigs have four toed hooves with the fifth toe regressed. Many other examples, such as bats, whales, tyrannosaurs, and so on, can also be deduced to have had a basic five-digit structure through anatomical analysis. Lastly, I'd like to pose a question to you, the audience. We know that there are still many fish species today with some ability to breathe air and move on land. Apart from the lungfish mentioned before, there are polyteridae, pond loaches, and periothalminae, among others. Some of them spend most of their time on land. So, do you think it's possible that among these fish in the future, there might be one that, like our ancestors, eventually makes it onto the land, becoming a terrestrial vertebrate? This question doesn't have a clear answer, but feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section. This is Ancient Discovery. See you in the next video. Goodbye.